When you're the president of one of the planet's most dangerous and reclusive nations, the transportation of your leader is something that is as serious as it gets. This is certainly the case with North Korea, and when transporting its president, Kim Jong-un, it takes just about every precaution possible. So come with me as we explore how North Korea transports Kim Jong-un's most secure convoy. Why is transportation such a big deal? When you're the supreme leader of a country in one of the world's most tense areas with very few allies, travel is not something you take lightly, and Kim Jong-un certainly takes transportation seriously. Kim isn't exactly the most popular person out there, and there are quite a few people who would be happy to hurt him or worse. This is a common issue with rulers all over the world, actually. Assassination attempts can come at any time, and when moving from place to place, the risk is higher. Many world leaders have protocols and personnel to help prevent these occurrences and guarantee their safety. With Kim Jong-un, the need for security is perhaps even higher. As previously stated, North Korea has a very tense relationship with not only some of its neighbors, but also with the U.S. Tension that has only escalated since North Korea started developing and testing intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of carrying nuclear payloads. There have allegedly been attempts on Kim Jong-un's life in the past, and so it comes as no shock that Kim is very particular about his security when traveling, especially when traveling abroad. So how does Kim travel, and what sort of defenses are used to protect him? Kim is regarded as the single most important individual of the North Korean state. Really, he is explicitly named as the supreme leader who represents the state in the country's constitution. Citizens regard him as almost a deity. Traveling for someone so important has to take the utmost security, but also the utmost luxury. Kim is accustomed to a certain standard of living, and when he travels, that is also reflected. In every form of transportation he uses, opulence is shown. After all, wealth also projects power. And when you're Kim Jong-un, power is one thing you want to project. So whether he's on the road, on his beloved train, or in the air, luxury and security are the two constants in every case. While on the subject of different forms of transportation, it is important to note the forms of transportation used by Kim in the first place. Kim is known to have a particular affinity for rail, and he's been noted traveling by road multiple times. However, sea travel and air travel are particularly rare for the ruler, for reasons that we will soon get into. Certainly, these modes have their own various challenges with regard to security, especially when you consider that they transport the most important citizens in the country. However, it seems that North Korea has figured figured out the best ways to transport their ruler, although most people would consider some of their protocols a little overkill, especially when compared to the security protocols of other countries when transporting their rulers. However, to North Korea, it is well worth the risk. Traveling by train. Kim has an affinity for trains. He really does. In fact, it's his most used form of travel. This includes when he's traveling within North Korea and when he's traveling abroad. North Korea has a pretty standard railway system spanning across over 6,000 kilometers. It also has a metro system in Pyongyang the nation's capital. In comparison, South Korea only has about 4,837 kilometers of railway, although its infrastructure is more modern. It is very clear that travel by rail is very popular in North Korea. Well, one reason for this is that rail transport has been favored by the rulers of North Korea for generations. Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea favored using trains during the Korean War. As a matter of fact, he liked using them so much that he used a train as his headquarters and continued the use of trains even after the war was essentially over. During his reign as ruler of the nation, he started the building of numerous secure palaces, many of which were either directly accessed by or close to railway stations. Of these palaces, 19 of them were only accessible by the private trains. Clearly, Kim Il-sung felt that trains were the way to go, and the development of the Morths railway system started to really take off during his reign. However, even though he had an affinity for trains, Kim Il-sung also liked to travel by air. He had a special salon variant, IL-62M, that had been brought from the USSR, which he used several times. An example of which was when he flew on it to Moscow for meetings with Mikhail Gorbachev in October of 1986. However, Kim Il-sung is not the only one to have favored trains over other forms of transportation. In fact, he almost traveled exclusively by rail and was dreadfully afraid of flying. Il-sung's air phobia can probably be traced back to an incident back in 1976 when Kim Il-sung was involved in a terrible helicopter crash. That and the fact that he and his father had experienced an aircraft burn while inspecting it didn't assure him that traveling by air was particularly safe, and it seemed to have had a lasting memory on the former supreme leader. Until his death, he was wary of traveling by air. In fact, once he had told his hosts in Russia while there officially that if you travel by plane, you do not see anything of the country but the airports and the capital, while traveling by train gives one 
one the opportunity to see the expanses and the cities, the nature, and to stop and set the foot on the ground, to see reality with one's own eyes, and to meet and to talk with the locals. He had his own special train that he used for local and international travel, which he rarely ever did. Kim seemed to love trains so much that he actually died on his train on the 17th of December 2011. Since taking on the mantle of supreme leader, Kim Jong-un has also followed in the footsteps of his father and great-grandfather in using trains as his preferred form of transportation. He too has his own special train and he uses it to this day. To show just how special trains are to the rulers of North Korea, there is actually a museum where citizens and tourists can actually experience how the past rulers used to travel. This is at the Komsu San Palace of the Sun, where reconstructions of Kim Jong-un's father's and grandfather's train cars and their preserved and displayed remains too. What kind of trains does Kim use? Kim's train is not just a form of transportation to him. Since while he travels on it, he tends to spend a decent amount of time on it. He needs it to be a mobile base of operations from which he runs the whole country. He also needs it to be as comfy as possible and provide all the amenities that he's used to. So just what kind of train can fit these requirements? Kim's personal train is made up of 21 green bulletproof carriages. They are heavily armored to defend against attacks. With how armored the trains are, it's no surprise that they aren't exactly the fastest vehicles in the world, topping out at about 37 miles or 60 kilometers an hour. However, what they lack in speed, they make up for in everything else. There is not a lot recorded about the trains, but photographs from state media. Since photography isn't allowed by individuals inside such an important vehicle, for security reasons, accounts from defectors and reports from intelligence agencies paint a picture of just how being on the train is like. The cars are designed with distinctive green with yellow stripes on the outside. On the inside, however, you have glossy white interiors with long tables for briefings and flat screen monitors, bedrooms with silk sheets and expensive furniture. Other images show rooms with red leather armchairs. The trains are even equipped with a communications center, offices the supreme leader can work in, and some of the most expensive food and drinks you can get anywhere in the world. Also, the presidential convoy travels isolated. It's hard to even imagine any other train using the same rail line as Kim while he's on the move. If an attack ever happens on the convoy, the slow speed of the trains will not really be a factor as the trains are almost indestructible. The trains can also easily call for backup in the form of air support. They can even arrange for an evac for the president should the need arise, although that is highly improbable. It seems like everything has been meticulously thought out by the North Korean government. Even the biological waste of the supreme leader is stored in the train, as there is the fear that countries may want that data to gather sensitive information. To get a better idea of just how luxurious the train is, we have the account of one of the few people who have been on the train of a ruler of North Korea a Russian official named Konstantin Pulikovsky. He recounted a trip across Russia's Far East with Kim Jong-il in his book called Orient Express. Pulikovsky explicitly described all that he experienced on the train, and he seemed particularly fascinated by the food options. He claimed that it was possible to order any dish of Russian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and French cuisine, adding that there were cases of Bordeaux and Burgundy wines and even live lobsters. The travelers aboard the train were entertained by young female singers who were introduced as Lady conductors. So whether Kim Jong-un is looking for business or pleasure, his private train supplies all that. As I mentioned before, security is a big deal and so the supreme leader is always covered with regard to this. At any point in time, Kim Jong-un has a small army with him, constantly keeping an eye out for any danger. While on the tracks, this is the same. The train was designed to be self-sufficient in multiple ways, should anything happen. Not that it would ever come to that. The first measure is that the trains are themselves packed with a ton of highly trained soldiers, whose job it is to protect their ruler at all cost. Even even if it requires their very lives. However, this isn't enough. To ensure that everything goes as smoothly as planned, constant surveillance has to be done, which is exactly why there's always a train that precedes Kim's train that ensures that there is no threat around. This train is, as you'd probably expect, packed with soldiers who will not hesitate to act if anything were to happen. Also in Kim's very train, there are also soldiers, and behind that train is another that has supplies and even more soldiers, you know, just to be sure. It told you some of their protocols were a little overkill, so while riding in a tank on rails, surrounded by soldiers and every safety precaution possible. That should be enough safety, right? Well, not quite. Remember the palaces built by Kim Sung-il that could only be accessed by private rail? Well, there's a reason for that. Private rail is far less likely to be attacked, especially in a state like North Korea. By using roles that aren't accessible to the public, the risk of people knowing about the movement of the supreme leader is minimized. After all, if you're going to attack a target, you have to know what it is first. All these come together to create perhaps the most secure railway system in the world. Merely knowing about just how secure the trains are is enough to deter anyone, and so far no one has taken the risk of attacking Kim Jong-un while he's on the train. I don't see why anyone would.
good. Traveling abroad with the trains, Kim Jong-un does not travel out of Korea a lot. In fact, since the start of his administration in 2011, he has only left the country 10 times to visit five countries. Most of the countries he has visited have been allies of North Korea for summits or important bilateral meetings. Basically, he doesn't travel unless it is very necessary. While traveling to these countries, his preferred mode of transportation is traveling by trains. Traveling internationally is a lot trickier than traveling locally. For one, it certainly takes a lot of time. When Kim traveled to Vietnam in February, of 2019 to meet with U.S. President at the time, Donald Trump. His train took a mind-numbing 60 hours to travel over 3,200 kilometers or 2,000 miles. This is to be expected when your vehicle has a top speed of 60 kilometers per hour. That long on the rails may raise more security risks than a short trip, apart from the fact that trips like this would have to be planned way ahead of time. What this means is that if there was any emergency summit that Kim suddenly had to attend, he would either not be able to make it or he would have to travel by another means. Thankfully, though this hasn't happened yet. It isn't known if Kim Jong-un will ever leave North Korea again. He certainly would if he had to meet with US President Joe Bowden to continue talks about denuclearizing Korea. However, if the American government insists on meeting outside of the territory Kim can reach with his trains, he may be forced to use another form of transport, like he did in 2018 when meeting Donald Trump for the first time. We'll get to that in a moment. Traveling internationally by train is more than just a preference, however. For one, it helps project a certain image for Kim. His pre Preference for train travel serves as a powerful tool for symbolic messaging. It showcases his commitment to a traditional image of leadership, aligning with the legacy of his grandfather, Kim Il-sung. By emulating the elder Kim's famous train journeys to meet world leaders, Kim Jong-un portrays himself as a continuator of this legacy, reinforcing his legitimacy in the eyes of his people and the international community. Traveling by train also helps create a level of control over his itinerary and surroundings that other modes of transportation just do not provide. Air travel, for example, involves complex logistics and potential security vulnerabilities, such as the likelihood of being shot down, which for Kim is a probability he wouldn't want to test out. A train journey also permits more discretion as it's less accessible to the general public, especially in North Korea, where the nation operates a tightly controlled rail network, ensuring a controlled environment and reducing the risk of unexpected incidents or security breaches. This method of travel provides a more secure means of transport for Kim as it minimizes the risk of targeted attacks or attempts on his life. It offers a relatively isolated environment, especially when compared to the public nature of air travel. Why Kim rarely travels by air. As I've previously established, traveling by air isn't exactly a popular form of transportation. This explains why Kim rarely flies. However, there's a secondary reason for this as well. You see, Kim isn't exactly aerophobic like his father was. As a youngster, he was sent to Switzerland to study. Anonymously, of course, it would be basically impossible to have traveled to Switzerland and back by train, as it would have raised many flags and alerted people to his presence. Chances are that he traveled by air using an assumed name. What we can get from this, though, is that he certainly isn't scared of flying, and he is open to the idea of flying, especially when traveling long distances. So if Kim Jong-un isn't an aerophobe, why does he insist on traveling long distances on his train rather than taking convenient flights? Well, a primary reason for this is that North Korea has a relatively poor air travel infrastructure. For Kim, it's even worse, since the North Korean government is not allowed to purchase luxury items and hence it cannot buy the kind of aircraft that befit its ruler. Most of the aircraft owned by North Korea are not modern enough and do not meet modern safety regulations, meaning that they are risky to fly over long distances. In fact, Joseph Bermudez, an analyst at the US-based think tank 38 North, had been quoted saying about North Korea's fleet, they don't have an aircraft that can fly across the Pacific. Most are quite old, because the fleet available isn't exactly the newest on the block. Kim won't be very likely to use the aircraft available for his trips, at least not till he can acquire better planes. It wouldn't be dignified for him to land in a foreign country in the kind of aircraft that would make his hosts snicker. If there's one thing about North Korea and Kim Jong-un we know, it's that image is very important. While most of the planes North Korea has are old, Air Koryo, the state-owned airline, has two Tupolev jets, which are quite similar to the Boeing 757 jets. They have a 3000 mile range and could make intercontinental travel. They also could be fitted to suit Kim's expensive tastes in comfort and quality. That aside, they also are quite reliable, with the aviation journalist Charles Kennedy claiming that they have an excellent safety record. However, if these jets are converted for the use of the president, they wouldn't be able to be used for commercial flights. This would be quite problematic for North Korea, as their Tupolev aircraft are the only ones allowed in and out of Europe. To make the use of the aircraft exclusive to Kim would be to deny other people, including foreign officers on official business, the opportunity to get into North Korea via the most popular form of intercontinental travel. 
When Kim does travel by air, when the North Korean Supreme Leader does travel, he does so in style. As always, security is a priority. When he flew to Singapore in 2018 to meet with US former President Donald Trump, he traveled on Air China planes that had been loaned from China specifically for that purpose. These planes included an Air China A330 plane carrying most of Kim's security detail. They went ahead of him to scout and ensure that there was no waiting threat for the Supreme Leader. They were then followed by a North Korean Air Koryo cargo plane, which carried equipment, including Kim's million-dollar Mercedes-Benz Maybach S600. Once things were set up, Kim flew in on the second jet they had borrowed from the Chinese, an Air China 747. This plane had been fitted with the luxuries befitting a ruler. Finally, a cargo plane carrying the delegates for the meeting arrived. It is improbable that the North Korean government would want to borrow planes from the Chinese government in the future. It's not that relationships aren't good with China. China remains one of North Korea's strongest allies, and the two countries are not just trade partners, but seem to be aligned on many global issues and have similar interests. The reason North Korea will not want to borrow planes from China is that it wouldn't really reflect well on the North Korean government. They would rather have Kim travel on their own planes. Constantly borrowing would make the country look inadequate and may project weakness. So what's the way out of this? Well, North Korea could lobby with the international community to have the sanctions imposed on it, which makes it difficult to get luxury products like planes removed. The other alternative to this is to develop and manufacture their own airplanes from scratch. But this is easier said than done. It would seem that Kim has in recent times started to open up more to the international community. In the meantime, he would have to make use of the old Soviet planes if he wished to travel without assistance from China or Russia. They certainly can be upgraded to some extent like the Soviet-made long-range aircraft, the Ilyushin 62, that transported him to China for a meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping in May of 2018. It was his first international flight since assuming office in 2011. Kim has been known to fly locally too. Media reports suggest he sometimes uses his private jet for travel within North Korea. The jet, nicknamed Chame-1, is named after the goshawk, the country's national bird. It made headlines when it carried North Korean athletes as well as Kim's sister Kim Yo-jong for the Olympics in South Korea. Apart from the Chamai-1, Kim has also been seen flying in a Ukrainian Antonov 148, and he has even been pictured flying an allegedly homegrown light aircraft and sitting at the controls of an AN-2 military biplane. Traveling by road, Kim's Mercedes-Benz Maybach S600 limousine is one of the few luxury cars in North Korea, and he takes it almost everywhere with him. He also owns a Mercedes-Benz 62S. The vehicles are armored, obviously, and they have bulletproof windows as well. It's also as luxurious as everything else that Kim Jong-un owns. North Korea really spares no expense when it comes to their supreme leader. Both the S600 and the 62S are reportedly equipped with personal toilets. This is especially important when he takes foreign trips. The aim of having the toilets in the vehicles is to prevent foreign spies from collecting samples that may reveal information about his health status. Kim's armored vehicles, estimated to have been worth well over $1 million each at the time of purchase, are also fitted with communication systems, which allows him to remain fully in touch with the rest of the world. They also help him instantly deliver decisions, and if need be, he can hold key virtual meetings too. His limousines are usually in a motorcade, constantly preceded and followed by security personnel, not like anyone would be silly enough to directly attempt an attack on Kim while he's on the road. When he travels, traffic is usually rerouted so that it does not interfere with his movement. Traffic is never an issue. The Supreme Leader also travels with a dozen trained guards who follow his limousine. They can oftentimes be seen jogging beside the vehicle when he's on the move. They not only scout and attempt to identify identify trouble, but if any attack were to ever happen, they would spring to the defense of their ruler. Basically, security is guaranteed, no matter what. The final factor when it comes to securing the motorcade is planning and intelligence. The itinerary of Kim Jong-un is very carefully planned, and there is absolutely no room for error. Seeing as it's North Korea, divulging sensitive information about the movement of the president is certainly not the wisest thing to do. The route that he passes is cleared and checked way ahead of him, and possible weaknesses in security are dealt with. Also, very few people actually know about his movement plans, minimizing the probability that something could go wrong. Also, if there's any breach, it can be easily traced back to its source. The vehicles are also checked for any bugs and possible electronic disruption. Generally, countries look out for things like this so that sensitive data, especially relating to national security, doesn't get out. With how secretive North Korea is, this is probably taken even more seriously. Trailing by road may not be as luxurious or have all the bells and whistles that Kim's train and plane have, but the standard of security is just as high traveling by sea. There are very few accounts of Kim traveling by sea, and there's almost no evidence he has ever traveled internationally on a boat. However, Kim still travels by boat sometimes. There have been a ton of
ton of images released by the North Korean government showing him on boats and submarines. In fact, in one propaganda video, soldiers are seen excitedly rushing to the shore to greet a happy Kim, who smiles and waves at them. However, apart from military boats, Kim apparently has his own yacht that measures over 200 feet. In May of 2013, when the North Korean state media published photos of Kim's visit to an army-run fishing station, a white yacht was observed in the background. The question of who owned the vessel came up, especially as it was estimated that the yacht cost an estimated $7 million. It seemed almost obvious that Kim owned it, but the question of how he purchased it also came up. As I've mentioned earlier, North Korea has various bans that make the purchase of items like, say, a yacht costing several millions almost impossible. However, with the absence of evidence of anyone else who could possibly have owned the yacht, most people agreed that it was owned by the country's leader. I mean, who else in North Korea can afford to buy a yacht that expensive? One person who provided proof of Kim owning a yacht is Naismith Memorial. Basketball Hall of Famer Dennis Rodman. Rodman developed a relationship with Kim through the ruler's apparent love of basketball, and over the years, they have built an unlikely friendship. On a trip Rodman made to North Korea, he had this to say about Kim. The yacht seemed to have, as always, all the luxury that money could possibly afford. In another interview, Dennis Rodman said, It's like going to Hawaii or Ibiza, but he's the only one that lives there. He likes people to be happy around him. He's got 50 to 60 around him all the time. Just normal people drinking cocktails and laughing the whole time. If you drink a bottle of tequila, it's the best tequila. Everything you want, he has the best. According to Rodman, Kim Jong-un also has jet skis. And while he was partying with Kim during a visit, they got to ride jet skis together. It would seem that while he's on his private yacht, security isn't as tight as when he's on his train or on the road. There certainly will be security available aboard the boat and surveillance to ensure that no attacks are likely to happen. Why constant security is necessary? So, why does North Korea go through all this trouble to protect one man? Well, because the world would be a safer place if it did. North Korea isn't going to win any popularity contest in the international community. Many countries view it as a threat to global security, and they have tried their best to weaken it, usually through a plethora of sanctions and bans. Defectors come out with tales of how dystopian living in North Korea is. According to one defector, when asked why he had defected from North Korea, he claimed, the biggest reason was because I didn't know when I was going to die of starvation. When another defector was questioned about his experience, he said, when people are clapping, if you don't clap, if you nod off, you're marked as not following Kim Jong-un's doctrine. You have to do it because you don't want to die. You chant long live and clap because you don't want to die. Accounts from people like this have led many people to wonder just how bad things are in Korea. It certainly hasn't endeared people to Kim either. Not many people want to go on a tour of North Korea if only for the many stories they have heard about it. Some may even wonder if the country would be better if Kim wasn't in power anymore. Well, North Korea may not be a utopia, but if an attack was made against its president, things could change very drastically. And not only in North Korea, it'll affect the world. The view of the country by citizens in the country seems to be much different from the account that defectors give. There is a sense of unshakable loyalty and belief in the state by most North Koreans. Whether this is as a result of fear, of speaking out against the government or indoctrination is for political analysts to discuss, but there is certainly a clear difference in the opinion of people outside the country compared to people in the country. Many seem willing to fight for and even die for their supreme ruler, and if something were to ever happen to Kim Jong-un, the volatile country could become a bigger threat. When you take into account the fact that it has developed nuclear weaponry and has intercontinental ballistic missiles, it's obvious that things could get ugly really fast. In recent times, Kim Jong-un and North Korea generally have been more open to international discourse. If the world wants to remain a safe place, it'll be better if North Korea talked rather than acted. The country regularly tried to show its military strength, and parades of soldiers and weapons being displayed is common. Those weapons could be pointed in every direction if North Korea feels like it is under attack. So apart from protecting the single most important individual in the country, global peace is at stake as well. Thank you for watching this video. If you'd like to watch another fascinating video like this, click on one of the boxes on your screen right now.